Well, good afternoon, Elkins. My name is Jason. I am uh, from Fellowship Bible Church in Bridgeport here in West Virginia. I'm under the prayerful support of my pastor and elders. I want to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. Uh, it's such a beautiful day uh, out here today in Elkins. Well, why not have a beautiful message of the best news ever to go with it? But before I do, because a lot of churches are a little mixed up and there's a lot of different versions of different Jesuses out there, I just want to clarify that the Jesus I will be speaking of is the Jesus of the Bible. It is not the Jesus of the Mormon faith that believes Christ and Lucifer are brothers. It is not the Jesus of the Watchtower Society of the Jehovah Witness that believes Jesus is Michael the Archangel. And it's not the Jesus of Joe Osteen or Oprah Winfrey that just is used like a little genie in a bottle. But it is Jesus of the Bible. He is the one that came as a spotless lamb of God, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the return as a lion of the tribe of Judah, the judge of the living and the dead. That is the Jesus I will be speaking about and the God that I want to introduce you to if you do not yet have a relationship with Him. Before I do, a quick reading from God's Word in Ephesians 2. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out desires of the body and in the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, but God in His rich mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up, raised us up with hands, or raised, raised us up and seated with Him in His heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For, the great, for by grace you have been saved through faith alone, and this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The word of the, God, word of the Lord. Friends, many of you have planned your trip down here today or this weekend. Many of you have planned where you were going to sit for the parade a little bit ago. Many of you have planned for what you're going to do this evening. Many of you have planned what meals you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. My question to you is how many of you have planned what's going to happen after you take your last breath? Because, friends, every one of us here right now is part of the ultimate statistic. It is a true that 10 out of 10 people die. 10 out of 10 people die. We are all part of the ultimate statistic. Friends, I want to offer you a message of love and hope that only comes to the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, many of you, I would ask you, are you a good person? Are you a good person? And many of you would just say, yeah, I'm a great person. I'm a good person. I do this, I do that. But by evaluating yourself as a good person, my question to you in return is by what standards? By what standards are you good? By your own standards? By the standards of your friends? By the standards of this world? By the standards of the most popular thing trending on Twitter or Facebook or social media? By what standards are you good? You see, the only way to define true good and true evil is by the measurement of the one who came before us, the only one that's ever been good, the one good person that's ever walked this earth, and that is Christ Jesus. His standard of good is given to us in God's Word, and His standard is, is the Ten Commandments. Not that we're under law right now, we're under the grace, but the law, as Paul says, is the schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. The purpose of the law and the Ten Commandments is to show you you can't live a good enough life. Your best works in Isaiah 64, 6 is your best works are filthy rags before a holy and righteous king. The only way you will stand before God is completely on the merit and the work of Jesus Christ and the work that He did on the cross. You see, friends, when I ask, are you a good person? When I ask, what's your heart like? you got to consider the degree of which Jesus judges and looks at you. When Christ looks at you, He doesn't look at the outside of you. He looks at the heart. And many people will say, well, God knows my heart. And I just want to gasp when I hear that. Have you never read Jeremiah 17.9? For the heart is so deceitfully wicked, for who can know it? Many of you here are trusting in the very thing that will damn you on the day of judgment when you stand before God. You're trusting in your good works. 
The example I've used since I've been here this weekend is the trees. Look at the trees in the mountains and Elkins. They're beautiful with the colors of the leaves, the greens and the yellows and the reds and the orange. They're beautiful. But if you look a little below the surface, you see that the leaves, they're actually dying. They may look good on the surface right now, but they're dying. Many of you that are within my voice today, if you are outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're just like that leaf. You may look nice on the outside. You may have the latest Under Armour, Nike outfit or clothes, and the, the latest gadgets and iPhones and so forth. But inside you're spiritually dead because you have no relationship with Christ. If that's you, please give me an ear to hear. Please understand that none of us can earn our way to heaven. You cannot earn your way. As I just read in Ephesians, you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone alone not of your works though that anybody may boast i can promise you this friends there will be no one there will be no one that stands in front of god when they cross over take their last breath and say hey god thanks for doing your part i did mine you will only stand there before the throne of god based on the merit of the work of jesus christ and what he did on that tree Friends, let me give you an example of how this works, how it looks to Christ. When Christ looks at you, He looks at the inside. When you stand before God, He's going to judge you on every thought you have ever had, whether you acted on it or not. Let me give you an example. If you Have you ever hated somebody? You've been so angry you have hated them. Christ said if you've hated somebody in your heart, you've already committed murder. Have you ever looked at somebody with lust? If you have, Christ says you've already committed adultery. God looks at the heart. And he looks at the heart, and when you stand before God, it's something like this. It's like if I could take every thought you have ever had, every thought you have ever had, every word you have ever spoken, every deed you have ever done, and I could put it on a DVD right now, and put it on a big screen right here on the corner of Third and Davis, many of you would run. You would even run from your families because you know the thoughts you've had and things you've done that only you know. But God sees you that way. So my proposition to you is don't let Him see you that way. So what's the alternative? The alternative is let Him see you as Christ is. And that is only through a relationship with Christ. You cannot earn your way, friends. It's all based on the work of Christ on the cross. So, so what's the purpose? Why do you need? Why can't you? Friends, it's, it, it, it's a simple example. You see, many of us that think we're a good person, many of us who don't consider us to be that bad of a person, that bad of a guy, or that bad of a gal, and I do decent things. Listen, let's say somebody was caught in a horrendous, horrendous crime. They were caught in that crime, and they were taken before the judge here at the Randolph County Courthouse. All witnesses around, and they saw the crime that was committed. What would happen? What would your reaction be if that judge would look at that criminal? And that judge would say, hey, I'm a loving God, I forgive you, you can go, no, no, no jail time for you. I know you did some good things in your life, you helped that lady across the street, or you, you fed the poor, and you clothed the homeless. You would be in sins because that criminal didn't get the justice he deserved. And likewise, friends, we, outside of a relationship with Christ, likewise, we are that criminal. We are that sinner. God bless you. Amen, brother, God bless you. We are that criminal. And understand that that, let me give you an example of how that works. Friends, if I were to tell a lie to my little girl, she would just get angry and forget about it. If I were to tell a lie to my wife, I'd probably sleep on the couch for a few days. If I were to tell a lie to my boss, I would get fired. If I were to tell a lie to a law enforcement officer, I would get arrested. What's the difference? The difference is not what I did wrong, it's who it was committed against. And likewise, when you sin, it's not against your fellow man you sin, but it's against God Almighty. David said in the, in, in the book of Psalms, he said, hey, he said, against you I have sinned. Against you I have sinned. And so because you are a criminal outside of a relationship with Christ, that addresses the biggest question in the entire Bible. The biggest question in the entire Bible is this. It is an abomination, the Word of God says, to clear the wicked. So the question, the biggest question in all of Scripture is this. How can God be just, righteous, and a holy judge who gives the sentence that's deserved to the criminal, yet be loved at the same time? Because He has to fulfill the judgment. 
Friends, you don't want God to be fair. You want God to be merciful. Because if God was fair, He would give you what you deserve and what I deserve. And what we all deserve, friends, is eternal hell under His wrath for the crimes and sins we have committed against Him. Now understand, as I am not here above anybody, I don't think I'm better than anybody here. I'm not condemning you. Matter of fact, the Bible says if you are outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are already condemned. I'm simply here to show you a way to get to God when you take your last breath. A relationship with Christ is the only way for eternal life. We have a lot of different religious systems out here. We see the idolatry that's been through Washington, D.C. and New York and Philadelphia with the Pope, a sinner just like you and I, people running to Him for forgiveness and He can't forgive anybody. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Me. With that statement in Scripture, Jesus just eliminated every other religion that is known to man. You cannot have eternal life through Islam. You do not have eternal life through the Jehovah Witness. You do not have eternal life through Mormonism. You do not have eternal life in any way but through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You see, friends, many of you walk around here and you smirk and you laugh and you, you, you walk proud with your nose up in the air. Let me tell you, there will be no proud people in heaven. And the reason why is because God humbled Himself to come down and take on flesh. He sent His Son Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. He was born of a virgin. The sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Christ was born and for 33 years He kept the greatest commandment that we're given. The greatest commandment we're given is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Friends, we can't do that for one second. Amen, brother. God bless you. We can't do that for one second. Jesus Christ completed that command, and He did it every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, the entire time Christ did it. He was here for 33 years, and it was taken to the cross. And on that cross, friends, made way for you and I to have a relationship with God when we take our last breath. On that cross, on that tree, the sinless Son of God the sinless, perfect Son of God was crushed. Yes, friends, God crushed His Son. Have you never read Isaiah 53.10 that says, For it pleased Yahweh to crush Him. God crushed His Son. But friends, you have a way to God through Christ, not because a bunch of Roman soldiers beat up our Lord, my Lord and Savior Jesus. You have a way through Christ because God's wrath was poured out upon Jesus. His wrath was poured out upon Christ all at one time on that cross. If you remember in the Word of God, it says Jesus looked to the heavens and He says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Many of us, we glance over that and we don't consider the meaning of the word forsaken. When Jesus taught, asked the Father, He says, Why have you forsaken me? Forsaken is a separation. It's to be cut off. It's to be cut off. It's as if the God, as if God looks down at Jesus, the sinless Son, and says, "The Lord your God damns you," and slams the door on him. That's what forsaken means. And the reason why he was forsaken is because on that tree, on the cross, God looked at Christ, and the Apostle Paul says, "He who knew no sin became sin." Now we need to be careful. Jesus did not become a sinner, but your sin, my sin, was placed upon him. And it was placed upon Him in a way that when God looked down on His only Son, He saw your sin, He saw my sin, and He treated Him the exact way a criminal should be treated, the way you and I should be treated. You see, friends, at the cross is where love and justice kissed. Love and justice kiss at the cross because God fulfills His justice. He pours out His entire wrath on His Son all in one moment. Amen. All in one moment. And when He pours out His wrath on His Son, Jesus drinks your hell and turns the cup over and there's not one drop left for you. Amen, brother. There's not one drop left should you put your faith in Christ. Should you turn from your ways and believe in Him and who He is. And when you come to Christ, Jesus says, the way to me 
In Mark 1.15, Jesus says, For the kingdom of God is at hand. Now repent and believe in the gospel. To repent means to turn. means to turn away. So many people say, Well, I went to church and I found Jesus and I did a 360. Friends, if you did a 360, you're right back to where you started. You do a 180. Jesus says, Repent and believe in the gospel. That you turn from your sin. You turn from your ways. Repentance is a gift of God. It's not something you do one time. Many people trust their eternity because one time they, they said a prayer or one time they filled out a card or one time they wrote their name in their Bible or one time they got goosebumps when the lights were down and the music was playing. Friends, don't play church with your salvation. Don't play church with your salvation. God will not be mocked by such idol worship as in most churches today. You fall on your face and you cry out to God and you ask Him for the gift of repentance. Ask Him to save you. And you turn from your sins and you put your faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone. And when you do that, it's known in the churches to be born again, but it's called regeneration. In Ezekiel 36, 26, the Bible says, I will take your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. A heart of flesh being your control center. That when you come to a relationship with Jesus Christ, you will begin to love the things that God loves. You will begin to hate the things that God hates. Yes, God does hate. God hates because He's love. Do you love children? I do. You have to hate abortion. Do you love African Americans? I do. I hate slavery. Do you love the Jews? I do. You have to hate the Holocaust. There's a balance there. God hates because He is love. The darkness and the light do not exist together. And friends, I will tell you that when you turn and you repent of your ways, you turn, it's a continued life of repentance. It's a continued life of faith. It's not something you've done one time. If you remember one thing I say is please do not rest your eternity because you prayed a prayer one time and there's been no change in your life. Don't rest your eternity because you walked an aisle and some religious authority told you you were saved. Only God knows for sure. Trust your eternity that you have turned from your ways. Trust your eternity that you have a relationship with Christ. You believe in Him. You believe on Him. Friends, a relationship with Christ is not based on a just simple, I believe in Jesus, so I'm going to heaven. Friends, if you just simply believe in Jesus, it will get you nowhere. James 2.19 says, Even the demons believe in Jesus. What a relationship with Christ is, is you've turned from your sins. You've turned in repentance. And you've put your faith and trust in Christ with everything. And once you put your faith and trust in Christ with everything, and you begin to live the life that God has. Oh friends, please, take these words seriously. As my fellow human beings, I don't want to see anybody here not take their last breath and be standing before the throne of God. Because see, many of us think that when they take their last breath, they're going to stand before God and they're going to make their case. Friends, understand something. When you take your last breath and you stand before the Creator of the universe, it will not be a hearing. You will not plead your case. You will stand for a sentencing. And the Bible says it's appointed a man to die once and then comes the judgment. So my hope and my prayer is for you to wake up and as you're thinking about all the fun you're having this evening and maybe to come this weekend, that you give serious consideration to your eternity. That you give serious consideration that there is only one way to God. And that is through the cross of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And friends, if I could give you just one warning. If I could leave you with just one warning. One warning would be this. Don't trust the circus acts you see on television. Don't trust these TV evangelists who simply want your money and promise you that you come to Christ and it's all good and you're going to have your best life now and that other nonsense. Don't trust those people on television. Let me tell you, Jesus says, or the Bible says in God's Word, all who desire to live like Christ will be persecuted. And if you think the Christian life is an easy life, Ask the families in Oregon of the Christians that just got shot execution style two days ago in the news. Being a Christian is not easy. It's not without some sort of sacrifice. 
Jesus promises you two things and two things only. He promises you eternal life and He promises you a cross to die on. That's it. To die to yourself and live to Christ. Many people walk and they hear the message of the Gospel and they turn their nose up and they laugh and they snicker and they don't understand. They don't understand like you, young man. They don't understand. God will not be mocked. Because just like this young man right here, God has a hand out and He's saying, Come to me. Come to me. Come to me. Be careful, young man. You're not guaranteed your next breath. Turn to Christ. Because many people are like that young man right there. And they turn their nose up and give the finger to God. And God has a hand out and He's saying, Come to me. Come to me. Come to me. And the other hand is holding back His wrath. And at one point in those lives, both hands will drop. Both hands will drop and you will face God, the Creator of the universe. And you will come to Him on His terms, not yours. So friends, get, give an ear to hear to the Gospel. Understand that it is through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone that you can have eternal life. Not through any other religious system. Not through any other religious authority. But it is only through Christ and Christ alone. For you have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Not of your good works that anybody may boast. Friends, don't trust in your good works to get you to heaven. Don't trust in your heart that says, hey, i got a good heart. As we've seen in the text, the heart is so deceitfully wicked for who can know it? Bow your knee to God. Ask for the gift of repentance. Ask Him to give you a new heart. To love the things that He loves and to hate the things that He hates. It's my prayer that you would turn to Christ and live.